Okay, everyone, I think we, uh, we might as well uh, start. I'd like to welcome you to this session sponsored by the McGill uh, Refugee Research Group. We're very pleased today to have a presentation by Matt Stevens, uh, who's Director of Lessons Learned Simulation and Training, a professional development a training firm that works with humanitarian uh, workers, particularly in the, in the refugee sector, with a focus on simulations and serious games. Uh, Matt's a former McGill student. Um, he's worked with uh, refugees and migrants um, since 2008 around the world, particularly in, in the Middle East. And since founding LLST, he's worked on providing educational content for organizations like Save the Children, UK, the German Red Cross, UNHCR, and, and others. Uh, and I'm, I've been lucky to work with, with Matt in a number of things uh, over the years. Um, as you may have noticed, I have flicked on the uh, lecture recording or the, the presentation Recording. I will turn that off before we get to the when we get to the Q and A uh, at the end. But uh, I will be we will be posting the the recording of this uh, later on. Uh, Matt will be running a online refugee simulation on Saturday. You sign up for that via Eventbrite, and I will post the link for that in the uh, in the chat. Um, Matt is co-author of a study he did with with Tom Fisher on the use of serious games in the humanitarian sector. I did that for Save the Children. It's a terrific, terrific report. I'll post the link to that in the chat while he's he's presenting. Uh, Tom will actually be talking also about use of simulations in, in supporting refugee humanitarian work to my Poly 452 class uh, later in the term. So if any of you who aren't already in my class are interested in that, you can email me and I'll give you the link to that. It's not gonna be, not gonna be public, but uh, others are welcome to attend. Matt will be chairing a panel on the use of serious gaming in the humanitarian development sector for the Connections North Conference in February. It's an annual conference about serious gaming, mainly about war gaming, but, but not just war gaming, other kinds of serious gaming. I will post the link to that as well. So I will be posting all kinds of things into the chat um, as Matt is speaking. But Matt, if you'd like to take it away and tell us about what learning games can teach us about ethical refugee response. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Rex, for that introduction. Um, and, uh, and yeah, for sharing out all those links. Um, uh, I want to say hello and welcome to everybody and to thank you for taking some time out of your day to listen to me talk about something that I'm really passionate about, um, which is the great potential of simulations and learning games to improve training programs for humanitarian workers. Um, we've got a lot to go today, so I'm going to hop right into, um, right into it. Um, but I always like to give people a quick overview of what to expect from me so you don't feel like you're stuck in some kind of, uh, you know, exercise machine you don't understand. Um, we will spend about five minutes on a quick introduction. Um, we'll go on to define simulation games in general um, and talk a little bit then about how simulation games relate specifically to refugee response. Um, and then I'll wrap up by inviting you to this digital uh, simulation that Rex uh, mentioned, um, which I put together with uh, Danica Bouchard and Miriam uh, Labelle-Oswell of um, the amazing Laval SimX team. Um, we're really excited to be sharing with that or sharing that with you on Saturday. Um, then with, with the time we have left, we'll field some questions and I will let you out within an hour, um, I promise. So let's get started. Um, I'd like to open up again by saying a huge thank you to the McGill Refugee Research Group for organizing this event, in particular to Megan Bradley for making the session happen, to Ian Van Haren for taking control of all the uh, communications, and of course to Rex for inviting me to speak, connecting me with the group, moderating this session, um, as well as in general just being a global champion uh, for serious gaming. Uh, it's exciting to be speaking at McGill University again, um, albeit uh, virtually. Um, so Rex did give me a, a, a fantastic introduction. Um, you probably are, are not <laughs> necessarily wondering who I am, but it's, it's, it's nice to give a little bit of a background. Um, as he said, I'm a longtime humanitarian worker. Most of my experience is working in urban refugee response in the Middle East over the past, uh, I guess, 13 years now, which is a bit scary. Um, I came back to Canada in 2018, looking to take some sort of control over my life. Uh, and form Lessons Learned Simulations and Training, which is a social enterprise aimed at promoting simulations and games-based learning for the humanitarian sphere. Now, uh, I guess the first lesson I learned was don't start a consultancy if you want to take control of your life, uh, but it certainly hasn't been boring. Um, over the past few years, we've run games-based learning workshops in Canada, in Jordan, in Kenya, in Switzerland, 
uh, and of course virtually to global participants um, and with organizations such as Save the Children UK, Oxfam, UNHCR and the Red Cross. Uh, we've collaborated with other world-class game-based learning consultants such as Chris Berlin and Imaginetic, uh, Tom Fisher as, as Rex mentioned, um, and our contributors to UNOCHA's Simulation Training Network and the Laval Simex series. Um, it's been really exciting to join this sort of motley crew of humanitarian game-based learning uh, evangelists um, and watching the, uh, the seed of game-based learning take root uh, in, in our world. Now, to get our brains working, I'd like us to try just a really simple exercise. Um, I'd like you to open your chat window. So oh, I've got my screen sharing, so it's probably a little bit hard to see. Um, and in a moment, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up a question on the screen, and I'd like you to, uh, to type your answer to the question, on, and then, but don't press enter. On the count of three, uh, we'll all press, press enter together, and we can see our responses come up at the same time. Um, so here is our question. Um, what interests you about learning games? What brings you here to this session? Um, if you could just give it a quick think and type out your answer. And then on the count of three, uh, if you hit enter, we'll share our responses. So I'll count us down. Three, two, one. Fantastic. So I see people using already using learning games for teaching, um, seeing strengths and weaknesses. Um, oh, it's really wonderful that there's people here that 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 uh, that are actually already using the, the tool. Um, hopefully we, we, you know, touch on a few interesting points over the next hour that, that give a little bit of uh, uh, inf insight on some of those things. Um, and if not, we have a Q&A at the end. So all this is uh, well and good, but what does it really mean when we say simulation games? What are these simulation game things? Um, and at first, of course, game-based learning might sound like a, something for young people, a way to get youth more engaged in a topic or something like that. Um, it's certainly part of it. Simulation games can be fun and engaging. Uh, they can help with motivation. Um, but simulation games are much more than a motivational tool. Uh, simulations and, and simulation games are models of systems which allow participants to reflect on information, make decisions, take actions. A good simulation should also react to those actions. So allowing participants to experience the consequences of their decisions. Um, many simulation games might involve a large number of participants who are all interacting accessing different pieces of information and working towards different goals. Uh, their actions might influence other actors and similarly they might be impacted by their actions or by the actions of other participants. Now simulation games in particular are abstract. They focus more on recreating the real life decision making process rather than duplicating the exact real life experience. And this gives us a lot of flexibility as designers. Uh, we can make situations simpler or more complex based on the decision-making experiences we want participants to explore. We can change time to make a, a long-term event fit into a single afternoon, um, or we can pause time entirely to, to examine the consequences of an action in detail. Um, now I'm throwing around a lot of uh, uh, terms here but since this is an academic context, I guess we should probably come up with a few definitions. Um, while we do this, I'd like us to keep in mind, there is no agreed on list of terms or definitions in this field. Um, other people might use these terms differently. So we'll have to see at the end if Rex agrees with me here. Uh, <laughs> but after a few years of work, uh, putting these things together, here's some distinctions between terms as I use them. So firstly, when we talk about simulations, um, you know, how are those different from games? To me, a simulation is an exercise which mirrors reality as closely as possible, right? So this might include crisis preparedness exercises where you sit at your desk, perform your job exactly as you would in a real emergency using the real tools, coordinating with real collaborator collaborators in real time. Um, this is typically how humanitarians at least approach the term of simulation. They might be drills with real equipment in an environment that resembles the site where you would work such as setting up shelters in a simulated refugee camp or performing simulated emergency rescue activities, clearing rubble, putting out fires, evacuating actors that are posing as injured people. Now, conversely, games-based learning or learning games are two terms which refer to any sort of game designed to teach you something. This can uh, take a lot of shapes. So I kind of have this, this spectrum and on one end you have simulations, very, very uh, uh, gritty, real uh, experiences. And on the opposite end, you have gamification. Now, gamification, at least in my opinion, refers to building a framework of a game around an unrelated concept in order to motivate you. Um, the example I like to use is number munchers, right? There's nothing really math related when you're moving around on the screen, but uh, it still can teach you a lot um, uh, as you move through the exercise. 
Now, there's a lot of different types of learning games that fall in between, but the, the, the term that I like to use uh, is a simulation game. Um, it's something that you know I, I apply to refer to a specific kind of learning game where you're reproducing a thought process of real life actors uh, with an abstract system. So when you participate in a simulation game, you're not doing exactly what people are doing in real life. You're not actually holding the fire hose or talking on the radio, um, but you are making strategic decisions, economic decisions, social decisions, ethical decisions that deliberately mirror those people face in real life situations. Simulations and simulation games do different things. A simulation is a good way to learn to drive a car, for example, but a simulation game is good is a good way to learn about strategic processes like project management or supply chains. Um, I also want to interject a little bit here and mention serious games. And this is this is a term that includes games used for more than teaching and learning. Um, and I'm not a, a, as experienced in this. Rex is the real master here of the analytical game where real life plans can be stress tested in advance. Uh, to identify oversights and choke points and hopefully avoid uh, making mistakes uh, when uh, when these things happen in, in reality. So now all of this sounds like good fun, but most of us get paid to actually work. So uh, can we make the case that these games actually do something that other teaching approaches cannot do? Well, uh, most game-based learning advocates have a bag of quotes we like to bring out in these situations. Uh, you know, one of the classics is, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. Um, or this one here from a, a, a game theory uh, economist, that a person cannot draw up a list of things that would never occur to them. Um, and I could go on quoting people smarter than myself, but uh, instead I, I have a bit of a summary that I like to, to give um, from my own experience. Learning games can be very effective at demonstrating the consequences of actions, demonstrating what happens when people with different goals or different conceptualizations of the same goal work together or in, uh, in, in conflict against one another, um, especially when we aren't given enough time to make a perfect decision uh, or given imperfect information. Um, a well-designed learning game will force participants to see things differently than they typically would in their normal day-to-day, -day, hopefully exposing some hidden biases or assumptions we may not even realize that we carried with us. Um, learning games can surprise us. They can make us feel strong emotions such as stress or excitement, uh, greed, pride, frustration, or fear, all of which influence the way that we behave when we're actually carrying out our tasks, um, and all of which are very difficult to, to reproduce in a classical uh, uh, lecture environment. Now, I'm going to give you a quick example. Uh, so bear with me here. I want to play a quick game with you. I want you to pick a card and remember it. And you know, you might not believe me, but through the magic of Zoom across the entire country of Canada, because I'm calling in from Vancouver, I'm going to reach into your mind and guess which one you picked, and then I'm going to make it disappear. So if you picked a card, um, I hope you have, and okay, now bam, did I manage to do it? Now let's take a quick moment to think about what just happened there. Um, there, there was no Zoom magic, there was no computer aided anything. Um, what I actually did was made all the cards disappear. Um, so if we go to the previous slide again, you'll see that what every single card that was in this list does not appear in the second list. And you are just paying attention to one, right? Now, yeah, this is a, a simple card trick, right? But what does it tell us about perception, about tunnel vision, about uh, how, how, how this might relate to what happens when we work in silos, such as we do in humanitarian work, we're focused on our own problems. You know, can we draw some parallels with the, the humanitarian sector system, for example, where we're not looking at anything but uh, what is right in front of us? Uh, now, this simple demo also illustrates how learning games can create moments of surprised ahas, which last in, uh, which result in lasting learning moments. If you liked the trick, I bet you'll be, I'm, I'm willing to bet it's the one thing that you'll remember from this scenario, or sorry, it's the one thing you'll remember from this seminar by, uh, by this time next week, so. And to prove that I'm not just making this up, there is some learning theory behind these concepts, um, which is really helpful if you're trying to apply for, for grants or anything like that. Um, there's two major learning theories that help describe how simulation games are powerful educational tools. Um, firstly, if you've done much training already, you're probably familiar with Bloom's taxonomy. Um, basically, the idea that while you know, memorization and reciting is what we typically do in a school lecture hall, um, applying or analyzing that learning, oh, sorry, uh, Applying or analyzing that learning might be found on an, found on an exam, but um, that uh, the most effective form of learning is gained when learners go through the processes of evaluation and creation. 
Um, so learning to question the world around us and build new things. I mean, normally we don't get that sort of learning until we go out of the classroom and into the world, but simulations allow us to fulfill those highest levels of Bloom's taxonomy in the classroom. The other major theory that describes the power of simulation games is experiential learning theory. Um, basically, uh, Kolb argued that learning is a cycle um, and that uh, we review our experiences um, of ourselves or of others, the experiences of ourselves or others, reflect on what we've observed. We extract, abstract those experiences into generalized concepts, which can then be presented in books or lectures. Um, we begin to test and experiment with what we've learned. And finally, we apply it by doing something, by generating new experiences. Those experiences then lead to a new round of reflection and the cycle starts again. And while reflective observation and abstract conceptualization takes place in a traditional lecture, experimentation and generation of experiences can be very difficult to present in the classroom. So simulation games are good tools to bring those two sections of the cycle into a training process. Um, and again, we can even draw on some research um, that uh, you'll find in that, that report um, that Tom Fisher and I carried out last year for Save the Children. Um, in that research, we found that after taking part in a variety of learning games, 84.5% of our 50 odd participants felt that learning games were more effective than PowerPoint lectures, uh, you know, like this lecture. Uh, <laughs> uh, participants were also uh, overwhelmingly, sorry, participants also overwhelmingly self-reported that the lessons learned from gaming sessions would influence their work going forward. I um, mean, this was a trend that held throughout the course of our research. So up to 45 days after the workshop took place, participants were still stating, yes, actually, we, I find that these things have, have changed the way that I work. Um, so how do we apply this methodology to refugee response then in particular? Well, I think there's a, a important question we have to ask first here, which is, you know, can we even game sensitive topics such as gender based violence, displacement or the human effects of conflict. Um, at first, the very idea of a game seems to clash with the caution required when when dealing with these with these subjects. Um, however, uh, in my experience, I found that yeah, the answer is yes, um, if we are careful and deliberate. And this is an important point. Um, the truth is it's very easy to make mistakes um, when, you're, when you're designing a game around a, a sensitive topic. We need to be starkly aware as designers of the power we have in creating a world which imperfectly mirrors reality and which participants are learning from. If a game is designed around the perspectives of traditionally disempowered stakeholders as a central pillar, um, ideally with members of those groups serving as designers or as subject matter experts, uh, a sensitive approach can absolutely be achieved, um, but it, it has to be deliberate. And there are a growing list of examples of different types of games that take on this challenge and succeed. So um, with lessons learned, I've run an in-person urban refugee response simulation with a wide range of stakeholders, including displaced people, which has been positively reviewed um, and, and evaluations have shown that learning takes place. Uh, Save the Children has developed an extremely powerful virtual reality experience um, on the, the challenges involved in reporting sexual harassment in the workplace. And it is, it is, uh, it's a very, very powerful experience. Um, and of course, Rex has run a large format simulation uh, at McGill for almost two decades, which tackles extremely difficult uh, content from a wide range of perspectives. And again, um, we do have some research to back this up. So uh, here are a few excerpts from surveys um, with humanitarian respondents. This was about 14 days after taking part in refugee uh, related simulation games. Participants claimed that the game made me think in ways I never thought of the communities which we serve um, or reminded me never to think that I know everything people need, no matter how familiar I am with the context. And finally, you know, to, to pause before jumping into a new task. Um, so I think those are some, some very interesting applied examples. How do we approach simulating refugee response? Now, obviously there's an infinite number of ways to approach this problem. Um, in my work, when, when I come to it, I try to keep a few elements in mind. Mm. Sorry. So wherever possible, I think it's important to, to that at least some participants take on the role of displaced peoples themselves. And again, you have to be very cautious um, in doing this and make sure that the participants are briefed well. But this forces all participants to see displaced people as active agents with their own goals and conceptualizations of a crisis, rather than passive recipients of aid. Um, it helps participants to understand the strategies that displaced people bring to solving their own problems independently of humanitarian intervention, 
um, and gives the opportunity to demonstrate how much more important self-support is to livelihood strategies than uh, humanitarian aid actually is. Um, and finally, it helps to show the frustration and conflict that can arise between humanitarian workers and the people they're attempting to serve, even though these two groups of people are ostensibly working towards similar goals. I think it's also very imperative to be honest about ourselves as international interveners when designing a refugee response simulation. Um, for a humanitarian worker, as, such as myself, it is very difficult to admit that we do not always succeed in what we do. Um, you know, a system where you know, funding comes from donors, uh, trains us to upsell our successes and to underplay our failures. Um, but if we encode that bias into a simulation um, without deliberately uh, putting it in there as a, as a learning moment, um, the final learning tool will only serve to perpetuate the mistakes we currently make. Um, so this, this includes representing political considerations, the influence of donors or our own sectoral mandates. Now, what unique lessons can we learn from simulating refugee response contexts that might be difficult to, to teach in a classroom in other ways? Um, it may seem like a cliche, but it has to be said, one of the most important lessons that humanitarians can take away from a refugee response simulation is perspective. Now, throughout my career, the number one source of failures and challenges that I have seen uh, in humanitarian interventions is a simple lack of appreciation for the pers perspectives um, and ways of, of seeing the crisis for, from the people that we are attempting to support. What motivates people who are displaced or, or have, a, have experienced a disaster? What goals are these people trying to achieve? How are people attempting to achieve those goals? And what barriers exist to prevent people from achieving them? Uh, while addressing some of these questions might fall outside the humanitarian imperative, the fact remains that often the work we do either ignores or is explicitly counter to the goals and motivations uh, of the people that we're trying to help. So you know, is it any wonder that people often get frustrated when, uh, when uh, interacting with humanitarian uh, aid providers? More so, how does it feel to be interviewed again and again? How does it feel to wait for handouts? Or how do you fill your time in that situation? How does it feel to look around a camp and realize this is your home for as long as the, as the war lasts? You know, these are the sorts of things that we often overlook uh, as humanitarian workers designing projects. Um, now, of course, simulations can't answer all these questions in full, but they can give us a small sense of these challenges, a seed of understanding um, on which to build. What else uh, do simulations teach well in refugee response contexts? Um, I would argue that simulations illustrate the friction inherent in humanitarian actions uh, in a way that few other tools can achieve. Um, you know, we can talk about that in the lecture, but really experiencing the, the effects of it can be very powerful. So how do goods move from international stockpiles to distribution centers? How do those distrib distribution centers operate? How do goods get into the hands of the people that need them? Uh, and on what kind of a time frame? Are they arriving in a timely manner? Uh, how do goods move within communities once they're distributed? You know, do they stay at that initial point or are people using them in ways that maybe weren't expected? Uh, you can go further and say, well, how does information move between stakeholders? How do surveys and interviews produce qualitative and quantitative data? What's captured in that data? How is that data used? Uh, you know, what sort of conclusions do we draw when we're only looking at one piece or another um, um, or doing a, a, a fully uh, integrated approach? Uh, how do cluster coordination meetings improve responses? Why might agencies be reluctant to take part in them? So these are all questions that we can explore and learn from uh, in these sorts of exercises. Uh, I would also say that um, an important thing that we, we often overlook uh, in humanitarian work is, is a functional understanding of the economies of crises at multiple scales. So, you know, we are familiar with, with problems at the global level. How do donors influence the aid delivery process? What opportunities and limitations does that system create? But I think more interestingly, we can look at questions such as what are the household ec economies which displaced people experience? And beyond that, you know, what do people need? How do they get those things? What logistical challenges exist? But then what decisions are involved in those economies? Do people have to make trade-offs? What is the emotional weight behind those negotiations? These again are the sorts of things that we often don't capture when we're designing a new project as a humanitarian uh, actor. Now, these are just a few examples of things that simulation games can teach in this context. Um, you know, there's um, many, many more, um, but these are the, the things that I often emphasize when I do my designs. 
Now I could go on, but since we all have jobs we need to get back to today, or you know, news feeds on the on the uh, inauguration or whatever, uh, <laughs> I'll summarize by saying that you really don't have to take my word for it uh, when when looking at these things. Simulation games are increasingly taking root in humanitarian contexts across the sector, um, and when compared to traditional simulations, they're cheaper, they're faster to build, um, and they achieve many of the same learning objectives. But they have that additional value of providing perspective and insight on the lives of the people that we're attempting to serve. Now, this this little wall of logos here uh, is in no way an exhaustive mapping. It's really just the organizations that I've collaborated with, presented alongside, advised, or otherwise come across uh, in my work. So this is a small, small uh, uh, subset of the organizations that are, are taking this sort of approach to training seriously. Um, I have a few resources posted here for further information. If you'd like to know more, I, know, I think that Rex posted a few of those in the chat already. Um, Again, PacSim's blog, Rex's blog, is I would say the globally agreed upon number one source for simulation development uh, and design information. Um, definitely start there. That's where I started. Anyone who's serious about design should spend a lot of time uh, on that site. Um, I'd also ask you to check out my website, llst.ca. Uh, we're not quite as prolific, but um, we are setting up a mailing list um, and have some exciting uh, upcoming initiatives, including online workshops and simulation game design. So. Um, if you'd like to know more about that, that would be fantastic. Um, again, the, the report produced by uh, uh, Imaginetic Save the Children and Myself. Um, and of course, just feel free to reach out to me at any time. I do love getting unsolicited emails as long as they're actually about simulation development. So, um, and finally, I would say, you know, the, the best way to really understand what, uh, what a simulation game can do is to take part in one yourself. Um, and you're in luck. Um, <laughs> you do have the opportunity to personally experience one um, this week. So the fantastically talented uh, Danica Bouchard and Miriam Labrie Lassell of uh, the Laval Simex team um, have been kind enough to collaborate with me on a new, sorry, on a newly designed digital simulation put together uh, explicitly for this group. Um, so I will I will say we've 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 done a test run, but um, expect to to be uh, you know in, engaging in something that's fairly new. Um, the exercise centers around a needs assessment in a fictional urbanized refugee response scenario, um, and it will be digital uh, and online. So um, we'll send you some some information on that um, in advance. How to sign up for the system. Uh, we're looking for around twenty participants total. Um, we're already about half full, so having space for another. 10 or so people, um, please do sign up. Um, if you can, if you're thinking about it, do so uh, quickly because um, we, uh, we'd we like to share some, some info with you tomorrow or the next day um, to make sure you're prepared. Uh, it's on Saturday the 23rd at 1 p.m. Uh, and should run for about three hours, including briefing, simulation, and debriefing. Um, the registration link is here, but um, again, you can find it on the email announcement on the McGill Refugee Research Group website uh, and, and at PacSims. Uh, hopefully at my website as well. <laughs> if not, then I better post that. Um, if we do uh, end up filling the, the ranks entirely, we're also uh, considering opening up the session to observers as well. So it'd be fantastic to see you all there. And actually, that's about all I have to say for today. So I probably spoke a bit too fast. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank you for listening. Don't hesitate to reach out and uh, let's open the floor up for some questions.